15 minutes or less lecture series human anatomy chapter 21 special senses part one so these special senses are basically the senses we have that are localized to our head they include things like gustation or taste olfaction or smell vision auditory hearing uh, equilibrium uh, so for example olfaction olfaction is sensory receptors are called the olfactory receptors and they are localized to the olfactory epithelium on the uh, roof of the nasal cavity. Uh, the structures that actually detect the chemicals or odorants that um, stimulate olfaction are the olfactory hairs of the sensory neurons. So the first order sensory neurons are the structures, the receptors that are binding to chemicals that dissolve in the mucus. So there are seven primary odors, musky, putrid, pungent, amphoraceous, ethereal, floral, pepperminty. These, everybody has. Everybody can detect these scents if they have a proper finely function olfactory uh, epithelium. And then there are thousands of other chemicals, thousands of other senses that people can detect, but it varies from person to person. So not everyone smells something and actually gets the same uh, information. So within the uh, olfactory epithelium, and as already mentioned, we have the uh, olfactory receptors that are sensory neurons themselves. There are support cells, actual epithelial cells that provide physical support, provide nourishment for the receptors, and also electrical stimulation. And there are the basal cells. Basal cells are actually stem cells that can develop into new olfactory receptors, which is amazing because that means this is one location where we have neurons dividing and developing all the time. Uh, there are also some glands found within the olfactory epithelium that produce spice-surprise mucus. Again, the chemicals, the odorants, must be able to dissolve into the mucus before they can bind to the olfactory receptors. So when we get a signal for olfaction, we detect an odor. First, the olfactory epithelium, the uh, olfactory receptors, will send the information to the olfactory bulb. And from there, there'll be a synapsing, and then the information will be sent to the temporal lobe, where the primary olfactory area is. This is the one sense that bypasses the thalamus, so it does not go through the thalamus. It bypasses the thalamus, so there are only two sensory uh, neurons involved. The uh, receptor, which is also the sensory neuron, number one primary sensory neuron, and then synapsing in the olfactory bulb, the secondary sensory neuron. Gustation or taste, that is localized to the mouth. This is primarily found on the superior surface of the tongue. There's a few in, in the throat and epiglottis, primarily on the tongue. Found in bumps, referred to as papillae, and many of these bumps possess taste buds. So there are four primarily types of bumps. The ones that are officially taste buds include the uh, valate uh, papillae, which form a inverted V at the posterior end of the tongue. These are the largest structures. There's the fungiform papillae, which are scattered all over the surface of the tongue, and they're sort of mushroom shaped. And then the foliate papillae, which are found in the lateral trenches of the tongue. However, these are only active in young children. Finally, there are additional bumps called the filiform papillae, but these do not have any taste function. They're primarily there served as a, a friction surface so that the tongue can easily manipulate things in the mouth. So if you look at a papillae, you'll see the taste bud structure within it. This includes the basal cells. The basal cells are stem cells that can divide into the support cells. Support cells then surround the gustatory receptor cells, and they provide nourishment, support, et cetera, for the uh, receptor cells. And these supporting cells can differentiate into the gustatory receptor cells. Finally, we have the gustatory receptor cells. These cells possess long villous structures that have receptors that bind to chemicals called tastants and they protrude through the taste core of the taste bud. So that means our receptor, our gustatory receptor cells are a separate structure from the sensory neurons. So those uh, gustatory receptor cells also make contact with the primary sensory neurons, the first order neurons. And these receptors are of course hemoreceptors because they're binding to chemicals that can dissolve in saliva. There are five primary tastes, sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami, which means meaty or savory. And so the taste and the chemicals must be able to bind, uh, dissolve to sal into saliva before they can bind to the receptors on the gustatory receptor cell. So the first order sensory neurons will synapse with the uh, receptors and carry the signal to the medulla oblongata. There they'll synapse with the secondary 
orders sensory neurons to carry up to the thalamus and from there synapse to carry the sensation to the parietal lobe where the primary gustatory area is. The three main nerves that carry the gustatory sensation is the facial nerves, the anterior two thirds of the tongue, the glossopharyngeal nerves, the posterior third of the tongue, and the vagus, or the few receptors in the epiglottis and pharynx. Vision. Vision, as we know, is localized to eyes. There are various accessory structures that are important. We have the eyelashes and eyebrows, these little hair like structures that attempt to keep things from falling into the eyes. Uh, there's the eyelids or palpebrae. Uh, that help to close and open over the eye to provide it with protection and to help with lubrication and moisture. Uh, the upper eyelid is moved by a muscle called the levator palpebrae superioris muscle. The fissure or space between the eyelids, or referred to as the palpable fissure, which can obviously change size, size depending on if your eyes are wide open or closed. At the corners, you have the lateral commissure at the lateral corner and the medial commissure at the medial corner. Uh, there's also a lacrimal gland. This is a lateral superior structure above the eyeball. It produces lacrimal fluid, aka tear fluid. This fluid is always produced at a low level in order to keep the eye properly lubricated. Um, the fluid is primarily water with a little bit of mucus, some electrolytes, and lysozyme to help uh, defend against pathogens. Um, so the lacrimal gland releases the lacrimal fluid through the lacrimal ducts. This will Go over the surface of the eye, lubricating it. It will then eventually reach the medial commissure, will enter the uh, lacrimal canals, finally enter the lacrimal sac, go through the nasal lacrimal duct, and enter the nasal cavity. So we have a connection directly from the eyes to the nasal cavity. This is why when you cry, your nose gets very runny. Lots of fluid is going into the nose, the nasal cavity. All right, the eye itself. The eyeball has three main layers. The outermost layer is the fibrous tunic. Is the outermost layer. It consists of the very front of the eye, the cornea, which is a transparent structure that allows light to pass through and focuses the light a little bit. And then everywhere else you have the opaque white material called the sclera. The sclera is very important for structural purposes to help keep the eye holding its shape, as well as an insertion site for muscles that move the eyeball. Uh, Directly uh, after the cornea is the anterior cavity. This is an open space filled with fluid. Um, it is found basically between the cornea and the lens of the eye. Uh, the clear fluid, primarily water, um, gets drained into the scleral venous sinuses, as shown here. So the fluid comes from the blood and then is returned to the blood. On the vascular layer, the middle layer of the eye, um, in the posterior area you have the choroid. The choroid is a layer of tissue that is highly vascularized, has lots of blood vessels running through it. Um, it is a dark color to help absorb uh, photons or light. More toward the anterior region you have the ciliary body. The ciliary body is made up of the ciliary muscles. These are actually smooth muscle muscles that attach to fibers, the zonular fibers that then attach to the lens. So the ciliary muscles actually are able to control the shape of the lens allowing us to focus light as it passes through the lens. And then the ciliary processes are the exact structures that are able to attach to the fibers. So the muscles, ciliary muscles control the fibers. Uh, the ciliary processes actually physically attach to the fibers that attach to the lens. Uh, also found in this layer is the iris. The iris is a, a hollow disc, uh, a disc-like shape with a hollow center. That is called the pupil. So there's a hole in the center of the iris called the pupil. And the iris is made up of colored smooth muscles. And these smooth muscles are able to control the diameter of the pupil, which thereby controls the amount of light that enters the eye. The innermost layer of the eye is called the retina. So in here in yellow is the retina. The retina is made up of two main layers, the pigmented layer that is more uh, superficial, directly next to the choroid, and then the neural layer that is deep to that. Uh, you also can see uh, within the eye a special area that is lighter in color called the optic disc. The optic disc is also known as the blind spot because it does not have any uh, photoreceptors. And it is basically where the optic nerve is forming as it penetrates through the wall of the eyeball. Pigmented layers, epithelial tissue, dark colored that absorbs light. Then we have the thicker neural layer. The neural layer includes the photoreceptors that are directly next to the pigmented layer. The photoreceptors include the rods that detect dim light, 
and are black and white in color and what they detect and the cones that work best in bright light and do detect colors. Uh, rods and cones have three segments, the outer segment that detects the light, the inner layer segment where the met met metabolic functions of the cell is, and then the synaptic terminal that snaps with various neurons. Uh, the bipolar cells transmit the neural impulses from the from other neurons or from the photoreceptors themselves and act as the first order sensory uh, neurons. These will then synapse with the ganglion neurons. The ganglion cells are neurons that then carry the information through the optic nerve. So these are second order sensory neurons. And as you can see here, light as it enters has to pass through all these layers of neurons and then pass through the photoreceptors before it finally reaches the actual portion of the photoreceptors that detect light. So light has to pass through a lot of layers of neurons before it actually gets to the receptors that detect it. Very bizarre way to have these cells organized. So the neural layer is backwards because of this. And this is also why we have the blind spot because when the uh, axons of the ganglion cells pass through the wall of the eyeball, no photoreceptors can be there because that's where their axons have to pass through. Uh, two special structures associated with the eye is the macula lutea. Macula lutea is directly across from the pupil. This is the visual axis of the eye. And at the very center of the macula lutea is the fovea centralis. This little depression contains only cones and it gives us the absolute best visual resolution we can get. So here's a darker area where the macula lutea is and the very center of it is the fovea centralis. Oh, look, there's a blind spot again, or optic disc. Uh, the vitreous chamber is the posterior area that is found in the eyeball. It is filled with the vitreous body, a gelatinous mass that helps to keep the eye structure maintained, keep proper pressure to hold the retina in place. All right, so the first order sensory neurons are in the retina themselves, those are bipolar neurons that snaps within the eyeball. The second order neurons then carry the information from the uh, eyeball through the optic uh, nerve to the thalamus. Now, as it goes to the thalamus, the right and left optic nerves form what's called the chiasm, where there's a crossing over of the medial field of vision, uh, which is very weird. So the lateral field of vision is go to one side of the brain. The medial field of vision is go to the other side of the brain. There they synapse with the third order sensory neurons and then carry the information to the primary visual area in the occipital lobe. All right, so here is another view of the visual pathway from the optic chiasm to the thalamus and from there radiating out and finally reaching the visual area of the occipital lobe. Uh, the lobe. Very strange. Disorders associated with the eye, anopia or blindness, can be caused by a variety of things. This can include cataracts. Cataracts is the loss of transparency of the lens. A uh, little solid particulate starts to develop in the lens, and over time, the field of vision gets fuzzier and fuzzier until finally you can't see anything at all. Luckily, we can replace the lenses with artificial lenses. Glaucoma. Glaucoma is when you have abnormally high pressure within the eyeball. This can damage and destroy neurons in the retina, and as this develops over time, it will lead to blindness. Basically, a person starts to lose the peripheral field of vision, and it gets worse and worse over time. Then there's age-related macular disease, another degenerative disorder, this time targeting the retina and pigment layer in the macula lutea. And then slowly over time, people lose their center of their field of vision, and it will spread out over time until they lose all of their fields of vision.